Looking a little bit more closely at this, we had 751 patients treated with endovascular repair in the Vision PVI module and 1,844 patients who underwent bypass in the Vision Infra module. This left us with 2,533 patients total who underwent endovascular or open repair. We excluded patients who had their first procedure before 2010 or who had endovascular and open repair at the same time, patients with concurrent PAD, any that underwent emergent procedure, and those who did not have Medicare. The final cohort was 1,356, and of this, we looked at 1,159 who had elective cases. Of the 1,159 popsteal artery aneurysm repairs, 34.9% were endovascular. Patients undergoing endovascular repair were older at 77 versus 73 years. After matching one-to-one, -one, there remained a significant difference between the two groups, um, but this was not clinically significant as if it was 76 versus 77 years. Looking at short-term outcomes, after matching, patients undergoing endovascular repair were more likely to be discharged home at 87.6% versus 48.5%. They were also more likely to have shorter hospital length of stay at one versus three days. And the incidence of mortality was very low in both groups. Looking at long-term outcomes, before matching, endovascular repair was associated with an increased risk of mortality, but after matching, this association was no longer significant. There was no difference in reintervention or major amputation between the two groups. So looking at our Kaplan-Meier curves here, this is for mortality. On the left, this is before matching. You see a difference between the open and endo group, but after matching, this was not significant. And then for reintervention and amputation, there was no significant difference between the two groups. We also looked at the reintervention index, which is a measure of the frequency of reinterventions. This is calculated by looking at the number of total reinterventions over the number of patients who underwent any reintervention in total divided by the mean follow up time in years. And there were no differences in the reintervention index before or after matching in both open and endovascular repair. We then did a subgroup analysis looking at patients who underwent open repair with single segment great saphenous vein. There were 542 open repairs with GSV. This was 71.8% of all open repair. Patients undergoing endovascular repair again were older at 77 versus 73 years, but this was not significant after matching. Um, looking at outcomes, open repair with great saphenous vein was associated with lower mortality than endovascular repair, both before and after matching. And there were still no differences in reintervention or major amputation in the great saphenous vein group. These are our Kaplan-Meier curves for mortality in the endovascular repair versus open repair groups with great saphenous vein. As you can see, it was significantly different um, both before and after matching. Some limitations arose in this study. Uh, clinical decision making and information on anatomy was not available to determine why a particular patient may have undergone endovascular versus open repair. A runoff data was only available for endovascular intervention, so we were unable to compare this with open repair. Um, selection bias likely drives the increased late mortality with endovascular repair, which is seen after matched analysis. Uh, information on great saphenous vein quality and size were not available. Um, coding data from the vision database also could have some discrepancies. And finally, as this is a Medicare database, the patients are 65 years of age and older, and findings might not be applicable to younger patients. So to summarize, patients undergoing endovascular repair were more likely to be discharged home and have shorter hospital length of stay. There was no difference between endovascular and open repair in terms of survival, reintervention, or major amputation. 71.8% of all open repairs were performed with great saphenous vein. Open repair with great saphenous vein was associated with lower mortality than endovascular repair, but no differences in limb outcomes. So in conclusion, elective endovascular popteal artery aneurysm repair is durable and comparable to open bypass with any conduit. Great saphenous vein bypass remains the gold standard option for treatment of popteal artery aneurysms and is associated with reduced mortality compared to endovascular repair. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Yes. Hi, Bjorn Zuko from Dartmouth. Uh, well done. Very well presented. Thank you. Definitely a contested topic. This is something that probably comes up at least every other week in our pre-op conference, which way do you go? And I think it's probably the biggest data series that we have, so thanks for adding that. My question to you is, do you have any 
uh, insight into the medical therapy of these patients. I know the VQI data set, although not out to many years in the vision match component, but at least at the one year follow up gives you some insight on antithrombotics, antiplatelet, and so forth. Is there a difference in the endo and open patients as to what medical therapy they're on, and might that contribute to the outcomes you're seeing here? Again, great job. Thank you so much for your question. Um, yes, we actually did look at the medical therapy. I just didn't put that on the slides, but there was no significant difference between the two groups in terms of antiplatelets and antithrombotic agents. Dr. Lee? Nicely, um, very nicely presented, and uh, thanks also, just like uh, Bjorn said, to bring it to this meeting. I, I think even more than every day at conference, probably every day in the office, I think uh, that, that we struggle with these decisions. I'm curious why the elective open bypass only had a 48% likelihood to discharge home, which presumably means 52% went to a skilled facility. Is there some selection bias, or are some of these that they came in with acute limb ischemia, got lysed, and while in the same hospitalization, got the bypass and had fasciotomies and or that um, needed them to wind up going to a skilled facility. 50% seems like high for elective FEMPOP posterior or medial approach to not be able to go home. Yeah, no, thank you so much for your question. Um, I don't think they would have had acute limb ischemia and come in because we had um, excluded the patients that had presented with that. Um, but it is possible that this group of patients was sicker and then they were uh, kept in the hospital for other reasons, but unfortunately we don't have that information. But yeah, thank you so much for that question. Can you comment on whether um, the Medicare database had issues with uh, identifying the laterality of reinterventions and amputations? And also, do you think you would have been able to achieve better matching between the open and the endovascular cohorts with uh, identifying those who underwent bypasses to the popliteal targets rather than tibial targets? And those patients would probably not have been candidates for good endovascular repair. Yeah, uh, thank you so much for your uh, question. Um, for the first question, uh, I don't think laterality was reported in the database, so that's definitely um, a limitation uh, and uh, definitely a very important point. Um, in terms of the second one, no, we did not include that with our matching, but it could be um, you know, something that's, that's reasonable to, to look into. It's an interesting point, because actually in the PVI database, you could probably also see the proximal and distal extent of where the stent was placed and sort of match anatomically, because I know you did propensity matching, but really anatomy is what dictates uh, the approach in a lot of ways. And you can actually find some of that in VQI. Great. Great job. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.